just, uh, I don't have a fancy slideshow or any of that business because I'm not as sophisticated as some of these guys are. Um, but that's okay too. What I want to do is I want to have a discussion with you guys today a little bit about, you know, this is the prepper show and it's about being prepared for things. And to me, in my mind, I don't see myself as a prepper because I was always taught to be ready for emergency situations before they happen. And I don't consider that being a prepper. I consider that being smart. So we can't control when the next winter storm is going to come through and knock the power out for a week. We can't control when the next evolution of a depression is going to come around and the dollar is not going to be worth anything. We have no control over that. So we have to understand what the mentality of that is going to be if and when it does happen and be prepared to take care of our family in that event no matter what. And I like to think that I'm prepared to do that. I like to think that I have enough of what it's going to take to be able to care for my family, bring money into my household, and bring food and other things into my household without going overboard about it and having four years worth of food in the closet because I don't think that's necessary, okay? I don't think it's necessary to have 400,000 rounds of ammunition in my closet. I just don't think that's a necessity. And there's reasons I don't think it's a necessity. A lot of people would disagree with my mentality, but I think that in the long run, for me, I'll be honest with you, it's a whole lot easier to say food than it is to go out and try to trap a raccoon. Because if something like that happens, what's going to be everywhere? Dogs, cats, right? I mean, hey, it's food, right? So if it gets to that point, I don't have to worry the food's going to be around because you can't afford to feed your dog, you're going to turn it loose. Thanks, you just gave me an MRE. I appreciate that. Um, but to be prepared to feed your family, you should understand how to grow certain crops. You should understand how to farm. You should understand how to do permaculture. You should understand how to bucket garden. You should understand how to trap food because trapping is much more effective than hunting because it's passive. And I see a lot of, obviously I read a lot of things. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of magazines. I look at people's articles. I look at what people are saying. I look at sites and boards and discussions, and it seems to me that a lot of the people that are preparing are doing it with the wrong mentality in many ways, okay? And when I say wrong mentality, are you storing 400,000 rounds of ammunition because you're afraid somebody's going to try and take your guns, or are you storing 400,000 rounds of ammunition because you're going to go out and hunt food with it? Because if you're planning to go out and hunt food with it, that ammunition's not going to last you very long because most people ain't a very good shot anyway unless you're shooting shotgun shells. And it's a whole lot harder to store a lot of them than it is 22s, all right? We'll get to that in a minute. But I think that trapping is a skill that every person should be absolutely familiar with. Live trapping, snaring, leg hole trapping, conibear trapping. Those things are something that you should have a very good handle on that skill and be ready to utilize if you have to, because that will provide you food much faster than hunting, much more passively than hunting. If you're worried about somebody knowing you got a gun, but you're going to take it out in the woods and shoot squirrels with it, four or five or six or ten a day to try to feed your family, why not just have traps somewhere that nobody even knows are even there? They don't make any noise, they don't make any sound, and when you catch food, nobody else is going to know you got it. That just makes sense to me. So trapping to me is a much more preferable skill than trying to be necessarily a hunter. And there's no reason not to combine them both. But I think that we as people who consider ourselves prepared concentrate much more on hunting and food gathering like that than we do on something that's much more effective and timeless like trapping, which is a skill that's been practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years. We haven't been hunting with guns for as near as long as we've been trapping food with traps, okay? Traps are more effective. Fishing is more effective than hunting is. It's easier to do, it's easier to master, and it's easier to catch food because it's all in one spot. I don't have to chase that one deer over 25 acres if I got a whole pond full of four inch bluegill. They're all right there waiting on me, right? That makes it easy. So I need to learn how to fish. I need to learn how to make nets. I need to learn how to make fish traps. I need to 
concern myself with understanding the ins and outs of trapping, both live traps and killing traps. Why live traps? Because live food never spoils. All right? If it's alive and I don't kill it, I don't have to eat it right now. All I can just feed it. No big deal. Possums eat anything. Raccoons eat anything. Right? They're easy to feed. And they, don't, they live a long time in a big box trap. So it's not like I've got to worry about putting them in a pen somewhere. I already got it. All I can do is put them, in the, put them in the barn, keep giving them food and water until I'm ready to eat them. So those are the things that I think about when I think about being prepared. The other thing I think about is when you look at, and this goes back to my mentality of always traveling tool heavy. If you look at the things that you may have to do, let's say that we're having depression tomorrow and we can't even afford to buy our own electricity because it's too expensive because we don't have a job anymore. Now we have to go back to that 1800s Amish mentality of no power tools, no gasoline. What am I going to have to do in that event to be able to take care of my homestead, my house, my camp, wherever I'm at that I'm living, whether it's by myself or with my family, and what skills am I going to have to be able to understand, and what, more importantly, what tools am I going to have to have to affect that? And that's the most important thing that I think people miss nowadays, is they don't understand. Everybody's worried about this big giant bug out bag beside their front door so they can run out and grab that 50 pound sack and head to the woods. For what? For how long? What are you going to do with 50 pounds of gear for very long? I could put 50 pounds of traps in that pack and it wouldn't last me for, you know, it ain't going to feed my family very long. I want 100 pounds of traps. I want to feed them for the long term. So I have to think long term. And when I think long term, I think about things like the traps are going to last forever. Steel traps, not snares. Snares are a one-time shot. 95% of the snares are going to catch one animal and they're junk. So having 12 snares in my bug out bag means I just put 12 meals in there. After that, it's over. Time to, time to find something else. Now I'm back to hunting again. Steel traps last forever. There's steel traps in Tom Parr's museum that are 350 years old. And they're still as good today as they were the day they were hand forged in Europe. Okay? And they'll still catch animals just as good today as they did then. And you can buy those old steel traps, not like those, but old steel victors and things like that, dukes, at antique malls, at flea markets, at yard sales. And they're pretty cheap as long as people don't know what they have and they're not proud of them. That's the problem. You get into an antique mall and they got a trap that's got rust on it and all of a sudden it's an antique. The thing was probably made four years ago and it just rusted out because they didn't take care of it. But they think it's worth 20 bucks because it's an antique now because it's got a little rust on it. So you have to watch out for that. But you can find that stuff fairly cheap if you know where to look. But traps are going to last you a lot longer than anything else for bringing food and they're going to last long term. You're not going to run out of a trap. You're going to run out of ammunition. You might break fishing line. You might break a fishing pole. The odds of you breaking a steel trap are pretty slim. But if you did break it, can you fix it? That goes into our next discussion, back to the tools again. Okay? What things am I going to have to do to be able to take care of all the things that I need? Well, what did they need along the American frontier? Every town, every pop-up settlement, every village, and every city had one thing in common, and he was one of the most prominent individuals in the whole town, and he was the blacksmith, all right? That is one of the top two skills that you better have to be prepared for the future, all right? Is you better understand rudimentary, what I would call utility blacksmithing. You don't have to know how to make a Damascus knife that's worth $1,000, but you better know how to fix a hinge on your gate. You better know how to forge weld an axe back together. You better understand how to make a chisel from an old file. Those types of things you need to understand. There are five things that you have to do with wood, and wood and steel have a direct relationship. We'll talk more about that in a second, too. There's five things that you need to be able to do with wood. You need to cross-cut the grain, split it with the grain. You need to be able to hollow it out. You need to be able to bore through it. And you need to be able to shape it. So the tools that you have should do those five things. It's very easy to carry those five tools in a backpack. If you have an axe, you can split the wood. If you have a saw, you can cut the wood. If you have a fro, you can split the wood. A big knife is a fro with a handle on it to straighten instead of 
up and down, okay? But it's got to be heavy duty. A draw knife that with folding handles like this doesn't weigh very much, but it will shape the wood. Boring tools, depending on what you decide you're going to carry. Obviously, the best boring tool is going to be some type of an auger if you're trying to use wood. But you can also use something as simple as an awl that's made out of rebar or an awl on your knife to bore small holes in barks and things like that. But when you start getting serious, you're going to want to bore some serious holes. You're not going to be able to carry a two-inch cross auger with you with a T-handle on it. But it's real simple to carry augers up to an inch and a half like this that you can find at a flea market for a buck a piece. So now what do I do for a handle on this thing? Well, you can carry a bit and brace if you want to. They're pretty bulky. They're a little bit of a pain in the butt to carry around. So I'm going to show you a trick. This is a piece of black iron pipe. All right, three quarter inch ID. It's got a half inch reducer in it that is quarter inch ID. All I did was throw this thing in the fire, heated it up completely, took a trashy auger and stuck it in a vise, put that on top of it and beat the crap out of it with a hammer until it formed around that auger. Now I can put any auger bit in here and I can cut any piece of wood for this. Now I have a T-handle auger that cost me about two bucks, and it's easy to carry. So now I can carry multiple bits if I want to, or have multiple bits with me or around, and I can use them, and I can have the auger, the bigger augers, I can have the, the braces and all that stuff in my shed, at my house, but if I'm building a bag in case I have to go somewhere else, and I'm trying to carry some of this stuff with me to be able to effectively do all the things that I know I'm gonna need to do to wood, in smaller scale, and that's what's important, you have to understand the scale of what you're going to do. Trust me, if you're bugging out, you're doing nothing in large scale. You can't carry enough to do it in large scale. So everything becomes small scale at that point, but you still may have to do exactly the same things in small scale. If I'm gonna have a draw knife in my shed, I want one of these big bad boys that really will do the job. Take bark off of trees, and things like that, that I can actually make dimensional lumber. But if I'm gonna travel with it, Something like this will do just fine. This thing came from a flea market for 20 bucks. That's worth it to me to have that. It's a good steel blade. It's a knife blade in an emergency. It will form any piece of what I need to form. And the important thing to understand is any tool that you're carrying or any tool that you have should have a metal handle. I mean a wood handle. If it doesn't have a wood handle, you're not going to be able to replace it very easy. If it's got a wood handle, I don't have to carry the handle. I can carry the head. And that's exactly what the pioneers did. They carried the tool heads and made the handles when they got there, okay? So looking at that and understanding that, we need to understand A, blacksmithing, B, woodworking. Those are the two big things that we need to think about is what, what, how do I manipulate wood and how do I manipulate metal? Because there's nothing that doesn't take gasoline that you can't make or fabricate from one of those two things, nothing. Anything that you would need in life for the rest of your life, other than food, one of those two things will make. And one of those two things will make the apparatuses to get food. And that's the important thing to understand. So if you understand woodworking, at least rudimentary, and you understand metallurgy and metalworking, at least rudimentary, you can get by with a whole lot more with a sack full of tools than you guys got a sack full of ammunition. I guarantee it. Although he could come up to you and take your stuff, I guess, because he's got the gun. But the point is, for mentality of thinking long term, I'd rather have the tools than anything else. Because with the tools and the knowledge, I can make anything I want. Now, I think that as bushcrafters, we have lost our minds when it comes to primitive skills. Why in the world? What I concentrate so hard on learning how to do things with rocks and bone and glass and stone when my ancestors didn't do it, all right? We had metal in Europe 400 years before European contact in the U.S. We were making fires of flint and steel. We were making fires of fire locks and match locks. We weren't making fires with sticks because it's not reliable and it's not repeatable. If you've got the skill, and I do, I'm pretty confident I can walk out any piece of woods and make a bow drill fire. 
but can I do it when I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I'm sweating, when I'm cold, when I haven't had any food for four or five days, when I just fall out of my canoe and it's 40 degrees outside and I'm soaking wet, when it's pouring down rain or it's snowing. How reliable is that going to be? It's easy for me to do it with a class full of people when it's 60 degrees outside and we're walking into a familiar piece of woods and I'm like, oh, there's a tulip poplar. Let's pull this off. Let's do this. Carve it out. Make a bow drill set. Here you go. Thank you very much. How great am I? It's not raining. It's not snowing. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. I'm not tired. It's optimal conditions. Okay? So what I have to think about is what can I use or carry or make that's going to give me the optimal chance to do the things I need to do in less than optimal conditions. And that's where we have to become tool heavy minded to carry tools and make tools instead of worrying about things like rocks and sticks. Sticks are for making shelters. Sticks are for making tool handles. All right, Metal is for making knives and files and saws and axes and fire steels and traps. Okay? And we need to understand that mentality. You cannot effectively work wood without metal. You can't make metal or form metal without wood because you need the coal. Or at least you need the hardwood embers. So the two are just like this. And you've got to understand them both inside and out. You should understand the tree species, what the trees can do for you. The trees, don't get me started. Um, Everybody worries about edible plants. Everybody worries about medicinal plants. Two seasons, three seasons, maximum. Okay? What's going to happen to me when I'm looking for mullein and i got a head cold and there's five feet of snow on the ground? That ain't happening. Guess I'm just going to suffer with the cold? No. Trees are a four-season resource. If I understand what trees are medicinal, I don't have to worry about looking for plants because the trees are always going to be there. It would take a dramatic catastrophe in this world to get rid of every tree we have and every piece of metal on this planet. There's just so much metal here. Think about it. As soon as European contact happened, the Native Americans looked at that metal and said, this is the deal right here. What do you want for that? There's a reason for that. It's longevity. They didn't have to sharpen it as much. They didn't have to remake it as much. It did finer carving tasks than they could do with stone and bone. So we need to learn from that and understand that carrying that stuff, I mean, I hear people all the time say, I say, well, why do you want to learn a bow drill fire so bad? Well, what if I lose everything? Somebody going to steal your pants? I can put a ferro rod and five lighters in my pocket. So unless I'm naked and afraid, sorry, EJ, <laughs> sorry, Clint, I'm going to have something to start fire with in my pocket. And if it's wet, it doesn't matter. I can make a wet lighter work in 30 seconds. I can make a wet fire, fire rod work right now. So they're not susceptible to water as much as people act like they are. So what's going to happen to keep me from having fire right here? Probably nothing. What's going to stop me from having a knife right here on my belt? If I'm wearing a good leather heavy belt, how am I going to lose that thing? If my knife sheath is made right, okay, and my knife's not going to come out of it, it's at least three quarters of the way down in a sheath and I got a good tight fit on that thing or it's kydex and it's got a locking mechanism on it like blind horse knives develop with the slide lock. How am I going to lose that thing? I don't need to worry about making a knife out of a rock. I'm never going to lose the one I got. Right? That's the mentality we need to have because what happens is we get so caught up in the things that we really shouldn't be that worried about that we forget about the things we should be worried about. I know a lot of guys that can make a bow drill fire just like that. But if you, if you handed up a 220 condor bear and said, go catch a raccoon with this, they'd be like, how's that work? It works all the time, and it's a killing trap. It works as soon as you stick your face in there or your hand. So why not use it? Why do I need to make this spring pole snare with a stick when I got this 220 pounds per square inch right here in my hand that weighs about 16 ounces that will kill stuff for the rest of my life because it's never going to wear out as long as I take care of it. I'm never going to break it. It's not going to run out of ammunition, right? That's, that's the way I think, okay? So tool-heavy mentality is what I always think about. And I want something that's going to be able to do all the things I need to do with wood all the time. Small scale if I'm traveling small scale with a backpack. Large scale if I have conveyance. I mean, how, how much do we hear nowadays about bug-out vehicles? There's bug-out trailers in here, 
Okay? If I got enough room to bug out with that, by God, I'm taking the woodshed. <laughs> right? I'm taking every tool my granddaddy had and everything I've collected over the last 10 years. Because that stuff is going to pay big dividends in the end. Because when you got food and I need it, I'll fix your tool for you. I'll repair your house or your hut for you. I'll make you a new grass mat if you need it on my loom. I'll, you know, my wife can make your wife a new scarf out of the loom that we got over here, and you can give me some food. Trade and barter is going to be where it's at sooner or later, just like it was in the 30s. It's going to happen again. History always repeats itself. And I'm not talking about the government's going to take everything we got. I'm not talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about history. I'm talking about normal things. I'm not conspiracy theories and paranoia and UFOs and Bigfoot. I could care less about that crap. I'll be straight up honest with you. What I care about is history. History repeats itself. Sooner or later, we're going to be in a position where we're not going to have the money we have now. We as a human race right now have money like a floodgate, more than we've ever had in the history of the U.S. Sooner or later, that's going to change. It has to. There's no question about it. When it does, we're going to have to go back to doing things the hard way. And when I talk to guys and they come to my school or they come to me and they say, I want to be an instructor for you or I want to work with you, listen to the lady, young ladies out here. First thing I do is look at their hands. Shake my hand. I want to see what your hands look like, buddy. Because if they don't look like mine, I don't even want to talk to you. If they look like you've been sitting punching keys all day long and never done anything else, I got nothing for you. I want to know that you spent time out there in the dirt and you did what it takes and you're not afraid of work. That's what I want to know. Because if you're not afraid of work, you can always make money. If you're afraid of work, you'll never make money. It's that simple. But to be able to learn to do the things that we need to learn to do, you've got to spend time in the woods to do it. And dirt time is what it's all about. Videos won't teach it to you. They'll help you. Books won't teach it to you. They'll help you. Going to schools won't teach it to you. They'll help you. I can teach you how to make a bow drill fire today. You're not going to own it. You're not going to own it until you've done it 150 times. Then you're going to own it. You're not going to come to my school and run three navigation courses in a weekend and own it. You're going to have to go practice it because six weeks from now you're going to forget it. All skills are perishable. I can tell myself, just being honest with myself, if I stop blacksmithing and don't pick up a hammer for a couple, three weeks and go back to pound the metal again, it's not as easy as it was when I stopped doing it. I can still do it. I understand how to do it. I know what I'm doing. But it's harder. I get winded faster, my arm gets tired faster, I can't form the metal as good, I can't do things in one heat that I could do when I put the hammer down the last time. So all of the skills have to be practiced. Hunting, fishing, trapping, woodworking, metalworking, growing crops, taking care of livestock. Those are the important things in life. It doesn't matter how much stuff I amass in my house, how much food I've got, how much ammunition I've got, how many hundreds of guns I've got in the closet. You can only carry so much if you have to leave. And you can only take care of so much at a time when the time comes. All right? So let's talk about my mentality for a minute on firearms, just in case you haven't heard it. All right? If something were to happen tomorrow and I had to find ammunition, every hen house, outhouse, crap house, and farmhouse is going to have two things. 22 and 12 gauge. Them's the guns I want. Okay? 12 gauge will kill anything in North America. Period. From a bear to a rat. Okay? 22s are good conservation guns. They're good close range, easy, taking animals down in traps if I need to, get a large coyote in a trap that thinks he's a little bit bigger than I am. 22s, Easy and convenient to take care of that. Those are the two firearms I believe everyone should own. A lot of people would disagree with that. But that's the way I feel. Because, number one, I can get adapters for that 12 gauge to fit almost every other straight wall cartridge on the market today. 22, 38, 9 millimeter, 45 ACP, 45 Long Colt, 40 Smith & Wesson, 32, I can get adapters for all that stuff. It's a whole lot easier to have 15 adapters than 15 guns, right? They're not eating anything, not spending any groceries on them. They're just sitting in a drawer, but when I got them, I need them. 
I don't know where you guys live, but I live in this area. I live in Ohio, southern Ohio. And he shot over 100 yards as a pipe dream. Okay? I don't need anything that's going to shoot 500 yards flat. I'm never going to get a shot like that at game. At game. Dave's talking about shooting game here, okay? I'm never going to get a shot like that. It's going to be 50 yards or less 95% of the time. So I want something that's accurate at that range. That's repeatable for me. And that's what's important. With every skill that you have and with everything that you do, I have engineering mentality because I was an engineer by trade. So what I teach my students is that everything boils down to Y equals F of X. And that's a complicated term for every output is affected by the variability within the inputs. So let that sink in for a minute because everything that you do from starting fire to growing crops to catching food to building a house to forging metal to making a wooden box all has those things in common. It all has inputs. Every input has variation and the variation changes the output. So I have to be able to control the variation within the input to get the same output every time and that's repeatability and reproducibility of the process. That is process capability in engineering terms. So what I strive for is in everything I do, I want it to be a capable process. Am I confident that I can take 12 traps and not 50 and catch food with it? The only way I'm gonna know is if I try and test it. So I go out and I trap for a couple seasons to get used to what I'm doing, to understand exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, what I'm doing wrong, what I'm doing right, and understand all the variation. Then I take 12 traps, I go to an area, I set those 12 traps out for 30 days and see what I catch. 43 animals. Personal. 43 animals two years ago, 12 traps, 30 days. That's enough to feed me. That's enough to feed my family. They never had to fire a shot other than the ones that were in the trap because I wanted the fur. I didn't want to just go over and whack them in the head. I wanted to make sure they got put down humanely and quickly, okay? In a real scenario, what are you gonna do? You know, you're not gonna waste a bullet, obviously, okay? But, so it can be done, and it can be done in a rural area. And I say rural area, I live in the country, but I say rural because it's only six, eight miles from town. That's rural, okay? That's not out in the middle of nowhere. So in a rural area, you can catch that kind of, you can catch that many animals. I know lots of guys that are professional trappers, nuisance trappers, that catch 50 coons in a week in people's yards, under their houses, in their attics, okay? Those wild animals are moving into our area because they have no choice. <coughs> We're squeezing them out of their own territory by building so many houses and by encroaching on their territory, so we're bringing them to us. It's not their fault, it's our fault. But we can exploit it in the long run if we have to because we know they're there. I don't mind the possums in my garbage can. That's just an MRE. It doesn't bother me any. I don't mind the coons getting in my shed. It's an MRE. It's okay with me. Um, so understanding those things to me is important. Having that type mentality is important. I want long-term mentality, but it has to have common sense. Long-term mentality to me is not, I'm gonna go make a bow drill set, I'm gonna keep that thing dry, I'm gonna dry it by the fire in my cave to make sure it works every time, I'm gonna build another bow drill set before that one goes bad and dry it in the cave by the fire. Mentality to me is, I'm gonna have a drawer with 500 lighters in it and 15 ferro rods. That's good mentality to me, because them things ain't never wearing out in my lifetime. You take a six inch by half inch ferro rod, man, you're gonna, it's gonna take a long time to wear that dude out. Especially if you understand the input variables and the process for using that ferro rod so that instead of striking it 48 times to get a fire, you're striking it twice or once. Now it lasts that much longer. And conservation of resources is a huge part of long-term survival mentality. Conservation of the resources that you have around you conservation of the resource you have on you and conservation of the resource that you have available to you. Those things are things that we don't think about, I don't think, as preppers. We don't think enough about that. Copusing. How many people understand what the term copusing means? I don't see one hand. I see one hand. Okay. If I know 
that over the next 10 years I'm going to make 400 willow baskets. I'm going out to the willows on my property and I'm going to start back trimming those willows so that I have a nursery tree that's going to grow straight shoots all the time every year. It's not going to grow one, it's going to grow 10 this year, 20 next year, 30 the year after that, 40 the year after that. Pretty soon I got to grow the size of this room of straight willow shoots to make baskets with. That's what coppicing is. That's conservation of resources, okay? I know that most people in here, if they have a mindset of being prepared, probably have a piece of land of some kind. Whether it's five acres or 500 acres, you got a piece of property. You have to manage that property, okay? One of the best trees in the eastern wilderness, one of my top five trees, I talk about trees a lot because I have tree mentality because I don't like plants. It's not that I don't like them, it's just I don't think they're useful. Um, is tulip poplar, yellow poplar. It's not a poplar, it's a magnolia. It's called poplar. Daniel Boone's canoe was made out of it. It was the first tree ever exported live to Europe because of its carving qualities. One of the most prolific trees in the eastern woodlands. It grows 135 feet tall and it grows like a weed. All right, like a weed. You can cut them things down and there'll be five more right there the next year off that stump. That's what coppicing is all about, okay? Cultivate that stuff because you may need it. Don't worry about cutting trees down. People think conservation of resources means I'm never going to cut a tree down. That's not what it means. It means I'm going to strategically cut trees down and strategically harvest resources to create a more sustainable resource. All right? That's what it means. There's a reason they burn acres and acres of forest on purpose every year. It's so that the forest comes back thicker and more lush than it was before, not because they're pyromaniacs. Okay? So we need to think about those things for long-term mentality, not how much stuff can I shove in this sack and put it beside my door. Not how much ammunition and ammo cans can I stick in my closet, how many gun safes do I need in the, in the basement. That's good mentality for certain things, but if you're talking about real long-term mentality, you've got to think about the big picture. And the big picture involves working metal, working wood, trapping game, growing crops, processing things, and utilizing resources and conserving those resources for a later date. Making those resources work for you instead of you working for the resource, all right? Because if I cut one tulip hopper down, I'm gonna get five more. Yeah, the one I cut down might have been 60 feet tall, and I'm only gonna get so much use out of that, but the five that are gonna grow, I got tulip poppers at my house right now around my blacksmith shed, you, if you watch my videos, them things are taller than my overhang and they're only two years old. I just didn't cut them down because I like tulip poppers. It's my favorite tree, so I let them grow. <laughs> I don't like cutting them down. Um, but them things grow so fast and they're a tulip poplar, carving wood, furniture wood, medicine, it's highly astringent, cordage, baskets, fire tender, rope. I can keep going. It's the most useful tree in the eastern woodlands. Okay? That's the other thing that we have to understand. How many people out here could walk out to the woods in the wintertime and say, this sapling is a tulip poplar. This sapling is a hickory. This sapling is sassafras. If you don't understand that, Quit buying ammo and go, go study trees, okay? Because I can tell you now, that stuff's important. Ammo's important, don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody in here to think that I'm saying, don't store ammo or don't buy any ammo. Not what I'm saying. I'm using it as an example because it's excess in my mind. It's something that we dwell on more than we should. It's not that we shouldn't be doing it. It's that we dwell on it more than we should. In my mind, primitive skills are, are, are right up there. We dwell on them more than we should because there's so many other things that are just as important or more important that we don't even think about, all right? And one of them is, what can I do with the resources I have around me, like the trees and the metal? So let's go to the metal for a minute, okay? How many people think we got a shortage of metal in this country? Been to a scrapyard lately? It's everywhere, okay? And it would take a hell of a catastrophe to wipe out all the metal we got. I know in the 4,000 acres of woods that is adjacent to my property, there's at least four vehicles that have been there who knows how long. 
but they're full of leaf springs, they're full of engine blocks that they can use for anvils, they're full of tool steel, they're full of resources, and they're there, okay? We're not going to lose the metal we have. So what we need to understand is how do we exploit that metal when we need it? What do I need to make this tool? If I want to recreate this, what can I do that with? If I need to recreate this, what can I do that with? All right, a metal tool should last you forever. But what if Johnny next door comes up to you and says, I caught four possums last night and I really need a good knife. Oh, no problem. Come back in an hour, I got something for you. All right, understanding what we need to do to make that stuff happen is important and those are the things that I think we should be conserving, conserving, okay? So what types of metal or what kind of metal and why? There's two tools that are absolutely the hardest things to remake with a forge and an anvil, with a forge anvil and hammer. Who knows what they are? No. A file and a saw. Those are the two things that are the hardest to make, okay? That's why there was no saws in this country to speak of until the 1830s. They had them, they just didn't have very many of them. If you were on a homestead along the Appalachians, what you generally had was in your family cabin, you probably had an ax, you probably had a carving knife, you probably had a fro. If you were lucky, you might have had some type of a smaller hatchet and a draw knife. If you had a saw, for bucking the wood down, you were high living because there wasn't that many of them, all right? But by the 1830s, saws were in common production in the U.S. Before that, most of them came from Europe because we didn't make them here because they're a pain in the butt. At least they were before the Industrial Revolution, okay? So saw blades are hard to recreate. What's the good news? They're prolific, they're cheap, and they don't take up much room. A bow saw blade like this one, ah! a bow saw blade like this one, don't take up any room at all. I can get a bow saw blade in this length that will fit a metal frame, a wood frame, or any frame I want to make for it, and I can get it in dry wood, green wood, hacksaw, carcass saw, bone saw. I can make everything else, I just need the blade. I can put 30 of these blades in a stack that high, that long. These are what I'm looking for. I want the tools that I can't make very easily, okay? Files. Files are difficult to make, but files are great for making everything else almost, all right? Because files are one of the hardest steels out there. So they make great knives, they make great tools, they make great chisels. Everything you want to cut with, including draw knives, files are great for making that. But files are very hard to duplicate. So I want all the files I can get. Give me the files. I just got a whole bucket of files the other day. And I'll take them as many as I can get. Because the good ones I'm going to save, the ones that are crap I'm going to make other stuff out of. All right? Understanding that is what's important, okay? If I'm looking for tool steel, what do you think the smallest tool is that's made out of tool steel that's probably common in every scrapyard, junkyard, rummage sale, yard sale, estate sale out there is? Anybody? Allen wrench. An Allen wrench. They're common as mud. They're made out of tool steel. They come in all different sizes, from this big to this big, okay? And they're, they give them away. Nobody wants them because <laughs> For some reason, Allen wrenches are one of those things that's like a throwaway tool to most people. They use it for what they need it for and they get rid of it. Most people, if you ask them if they got a set of Allen wrenches, they're like, yeah, I got a set somewhere, but I don't know where they're at because they don't use them very often anymore. Used to be a lot of machine screws were Allen head. Now we got stars and clusters and I don't know what we do nowadays, but we got crazy stuff now. So Allen wrenches are kind of out of style. So they're easy to find, they're prolific, they're cheap, and they're tool steel. So you can make a lot of stuff out of them. You can make an auger bit. An auger bit's not difficult to make on a forge, it's not. And you can make it out of 
a, another bit. You can make it out of another drill bit or you can make it out of an Allen wrench. Drill bits or something else is very prolifically found, but because they're already cut out to that spiral, they're a pain to make anything else out of unless you make Damascus out of them and forge weld them together into a big block of crap and then make that into something. But Allen wrenches are easy to find. So when I'm looking at things like what am I going to keep, well, A, I'm going to keep saw blades. B, I'm going to keep files. C, I'm going to keep a bucket of Allen wrenches around. D, I'm going to keep any tool I can find that's already a tool head that's not destroyed, even if it doesn't have a handle, because I can make a handle later. Axes, hammers. Hammers are, hammers are important, guys. Hammers are something that not a lot of people think about that you use almost all the time. Okay? What do you think the other thing that goes with a hammer is that we don't think about? That might not be so easy to get one of these days. Nails. Nails. All right? You can walk into a hardware store now and buy all the nails you want. In the 1800s, you had to make a nail if you wanted a nail. Or you had to burn the cabin down in Virginia because you were moving out to Oklahoma and you didn't want to buy more nails and hinges, so you burnt the cabin down, put all that stuff in a box, took it with you. That's how important nails were in the early 1800s. They burnt their house down to get them back. Okay? Nails could get back to that point very easily. So nails are something important to have because, yes, you can mortise and tenon joint. Yes, you can pin joint. Yes, you can dovetail joint. But nails are easy. Okay? It doesn't require chisels and saws and gouges and all that stuff to hammer a nail. Most Appalachian stick furniture is made with nails. All that fancy stuff you see on porches and in antique malls that looks like it's 400 sticks into a chair, go look at it. They put it together with nails. Because by the 1800s, that's where the term penny nail came from. A three penny nail was three pennies for a, three pennies for a hundred. A 16 penny nail was 16 pennies for a hundred. That's where that term came from, okay? They ain't that cheap anymore. Go price nails. Five pounds of 16s is <laughs> damn near a $20 bill, okay? So nails, while they're prolific now, you don't find them laying around most of the time. And if you do, they're bent. It's not like you walk into a scrapyard and find a bucket of nails. You might find a few nails for nail guns on strips. I've seen a lot of that. But you don't see too many nails. You find a lot of files. You find a lot of Allen wrenches. You find a lot of wrenches. You find a lot of leaf springs, coil springs. But you don't find very many nails because they're in houses. So until they burn down, they're going to be there. All right? People don't throw nails away. So nails are something that you should have a couple five-gallon buckets of, at least 12s and 16s, if nothing else. Okay? Let me tell you another little tidbit. Okay? How many people know what a cut nail is? Okay, a couple guys know what cut nails are. Cut nails look like a horseshoe nail, but they use them in concrete. Guess what? Case-hardened, high-carbon steel. Cut nails are high-carbon steel. All right? Not as high a carbon content as a file or 1095 knife blade, but they are high carbon steel, okay? So there's a, understanding just that stuff is where I think we miss it. As, as a peer group, as a community, as a family, that's where we miss it. We don't understand the little stuff that is really the big picture because we're too focused on what's important today. My buddy told me ammunition is out of supply at Walmart. I better go get me a box of 22s before they run out. Okay, that's important. But I got 10,000 rounds. What's next? Okay, next ain't I got to go get more. Next is what's the next thing on my list I need to think about that's just as important as that. Because if I don't have a roof over my head, I don't have tools to do things with, I don't have an operational firearm, what good is the bullets going to do me? If I break the stock on my gun and I can't make another one, what good's the gun doing me? All right? There's a story in Seed Time on the Cumberland. Is that a bushcraft knife? Is that a survival knife? I guess it is. But it's a butcher knife. Okay? It's a butcher knife. Should this be used to carve wood? Should I be taking this thing out and beating it through wood just for the hell of it? 
In today's mentality, absolutely. That's why I got it. It's my belt knife. It's my survival knife. It's my one tool option. This thing's got to, I got to be able to do whatever I want with that. There's nothing wrong with that mentality to a point, okay? But what we need to understand, again, is look at history, okay? Historically, this knife would have never been used for anything except meat and food. It would have been kept razor sharp right here on my belt and never used for anything like that, okay? There's a book out there called Seed Time on the Cumberland. It's a documentary history of the settling of the Cumberland Valley in the late 17, early 1800s, okay? There's a story in there of a gentleman who broke his rifle stock running from renegade Indians, tripped over something, rifle hit the ground, busted his rifle stock on his flintlock rifle, spent the whole next day whittling a new stock with his jackknife, not his belt knife, not his butcher knife, his folding knife. That's what they used to carve with. That's what they used to whittle wood with. They used that belt knife for food processing, for skinning game, so they weren't cutting holes in the hide from a dull knife. So when they went to slice off a chunk of deer meat, it was a nice thin slice. It wasn't sitting there five minutes trying to hack off a chunk, okay? So does that mean that our knife on our hips not our survival knife? No, it doesn't mean that at all, okay? That knife needs to be capable of doing a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that we have to abuse it. It means we have to think about all of these things. Should I be carrying a pocket knife for every day and should I be using that thing to be carving wood with? Because if I don't use this to carve wood with now, what am I doing? Conserving my resource. Just because it's my belt knife, just because I saw Dave Canterbury smashing his through a piece of maple last week on YouTube, doesn't mean I got to do it tomorrow. Because I might get lost in the Wayne National Forest next week and I might need that thing for a couple, three days to be razor sharp. So let me use my pocket knife for that. Whittling task, feather sticking, making fire, playing around, fooling out, making spoons, all that good stuff, okay? Because this is my one tool option when it really counts. So I want to start with it fresh. It's like hydration, okay? Knives are very much like hydration in my mind. 95% of people in the United States go to the woods dehydrated every day. Before the fact, before the emergency, before the sun comes out and I can get dehydrated, before I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off sweating, I'm already dehydrated walking in because I don't drink right anyway, okay? 95% of people in the U.S. do not drink the proper amount of fluids every day to be hydrated. So we're already behind the eight ball when we walk into the woods. It's the same thing with our tools. If I beat the crap out of this SD6 I'm wearing on my side every single day, and then I get lost with it, well, guess what? Now it's dull. Now the edge ain't sharp on it anymore. Now it's not going to do what I really needed to do when I needed to do it because I've been busy playing with it. It ain't a toy, it's a tool. Does that mean you're not supposed to practice with it? No, you are. You gotta practice with it, but get proficient with the task and then understand to conserve the resource. Buy two axes and beat the crap out of one of them. And then set that aside for your extra one and when you're going out, take the good one with you in case you need it for something, okay? This is the things that I think, these are the things I lay awake at night that my wife says, dude, go to sleep. I lay awake at night thinking about this stuff, waking her up. Iris, Iris, I just had this idea. Shut up. I'm trying to sleep. Okay? Because to me, what really drives me in all of this, TV doesn't drive me. Money doesn't really drive me. What drives me is learning drives me. I want to know everything. I want to be smarter than you. I want to know more than you know. Not because it makes me better than you, but because now I can tell you something you don't know. I can teach you something, okay? Because knowledge in life is power, okay? If I know how to do it, and I can tell you how to do it or show you how to do it, there may come a time when you need that information. There may come a time when the community needs that information. There may come a time when the family needs that information. And I don't care that you don't know how to start fire. And I don't care that you don't want to learn how to start fire because you're too busy playing Minecraft. It's okay. 
I got it. When the time comes, I got it. I'll show you. When you, when it, when you decide it's important, I got it for you. Okay? I'll show you how to do it. That's what drives me. The learning drives me. And it should drive you. Understanding everything around you is what should drive you. Not, it shouldn't drive you that you're afraid the government's going to collapse next week. It should drive you that, what can I do with that tulip poplar that's in my backyard? How many things can I do with that? Can I eat any of it? Can I make rope with that? Can I make cordage with it? Is it medicine? Can I carve furniture with it? Can I make a bow drill fire with it? I've absolutely had to for some reason. What good does that thing do me sitting there in my backyard? Because looking at it ain't enough for me. It's a beautiful tree and I love the way they look. That's not enough for me. I want to know what I can do with that resource. That's why God put it here. God put that thing on the earth for me to use as a resource. Not to look at, but to use. Remember that. God put that here for you to use. Understand how to use it. Because you owe that to yourself, you owe it to your family, you owe it to the community, and you owe it to God. Because He gave it to you. It's a gift. Understand it. That's what's important in my mind. Am I over time yet? How much time have I got left? Five minutes. It'll take me that long to quit talking. I got a little bit off track of what I really wanted to talk about today. My real talk today was going to be on operating tool heavy. And we've really covered that, okay? When I think about packing a bag for anything, anything, whether it is a camping trip, a hunting trip, an expedition, going out to shoot a TV show, or just going out to fart around the woods for three or four days, I always pack tool heavy because tools can do everything else. Whenever you put something in your bag, and I want you guys to think about this, okay? This is important. Anything that you put in your bag, if it cannot perform three vital to your survival tasks in three ways in passable fashion, why are you carrying it? It ain't worth the weight if it can't do that. Anything that you carry that can only do one thing other than something that starts fire because fire does everything else, all right? You're making fire, but the fire is sterilization, tool hardening, signaling for rescue, cooking food, making medicine, taking care of my disinfectant, uh, disinfection of water, right? I can, burning bowls. I can do everything with fire. So that's a multifunctional tool to me. So if it can't do three things for you, don't carry it. That's important. Tools will always be multifunctional. No matter what, I can do a lot with a tool. I can make Anything with this, you can make with a knife. I can make it with this. I guarantee it. All the way to a bow drill set, if that's what I had to do, I can make it with this. So, be familiar with the tools that you have. Learn the tools that you have. Learn them to the best of your ability and understand how to use them in multiple locations, multiple environments, multiple seasons, and with multiple media. In other words, multiple types of trees. Okay? And then, you will truly have a grasp on what becoming self-reliant is all about. Self-reliance is not about how much stuff do I have in my house. Self-reliance is how am I going to use the stuff in my house and stuff in my yard when it counts. That's self-reliance, okay? Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.